and somehow the music we all grew up listening to doesn't relate to our adult reality and our new dreams. The music we grew up with doesn't speak for us. David Castro is, where is David? Yeah. <laughs> David is the creator of the zine and now a true crime web series called Dead in Hollywood on YouTube. He's currently working on his first book, described as a true crime star map memoir, which I can't fucking wait for that. That's cool. David also made international headlines with, with Missing Husband, a viral video about the struggles he and his husband faced fighting to live together in the U.S. as a gay, binational couple. The video, which sought to repeal the Defense of Marriage Act, got one million views, with numerous celebrities sharing the video. Doma was later repealed, and his husband Jason has lived in the U.S. ever since. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, thank you. And we just celebrated what? Eleven years of marriage? Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell my story through beat poetry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> So this, so like Jen said, I'm writing my first book and this is an abridged chapter from the book. So my career space is the restroom where George Michael was arrested for lewd conduct. <laughs> On Tuesday, April 7th, 1998, British pop god George Michael was finishing work on a track for his forthcoming Best Of album when he decided to leave the confines of his Beverly Hills mansion and drive the short distance to Will Rogers Memorial Park, this palm tree lined oasis off Sunset Boulevard and a known cruising spot for gay men. Within minutes, he would become the focus of a sting operation by the LAPD. By the following morning, his name would be splashed across kitchen tables worldwide, a shock to some and an eye roll to many. From bathrooms to beaches, molly houses to piers, bathhouses to parks, gay men have always found unconventional ways to connect with other gay men for sex when it was illegal to be gay. Life finds a way. <laughs> gay cruising is the act of looking for anonymous sexual partners at known hookup spots, a lost art in the age of grinder and scruff. But be warned, cruising for speedy sex with a tall, dark, leather-clad stranger or a pot-bellied, middle-aged merry man is a creative and skillful pursuit, not for the faint of heart. The gay liberation movement of the 70s emboldened gay men to cruise more freely, even under the threat of persecution. But the shame of cruising was reinforced with the onslaught of AIDS epidemic in 1981. On top of the existing threats of policing and violence, the virus presented a new threat to men who went out cruising. These days, cruising has been replaced with apps and PrEP, a medication that prevents you from getting HIV, making it easier to prearrange safe, anonymous sex. Unprotected sex has always felt like a life or death situation for the majority of gays in my generation. We have a hard time accepting that we're not gonna die every time we have sex. It's been ingrained in our brains by a generation that wanted us to stop having sex. In 2001, when I moved to LA, Griffith Park was a notorious cruising spot immortalized in the gay novel Numbers, as well as adult movie theaters like the now shuttered Tomcat Theater. I'd visit Tomcat with friends more out of curiosity than anything else. However, the sightseeing usually led to us giving one another hand jobs. Pass the poppers, please. <laughs> it was innocent fun. It was friends exploring their sexuality together, a brotherhood bonded by a shared monk-like high school existence. I never got it up in Griffith Park, but I watched some friends disappear with bears and otters into the secluded hiding spots, of which there are many. I stood lookout in case Don John turned out to be Jeffrey Dahmer. There's a better chance, though, of hooking up with an actor from the Ryan Murphy series, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, than an actual serial killer. It's a gay rite of passage in LA to hook up with someone from a TV show. Just the other day, I realized I've lived in LA long enough now that I've hooked up with somebody from both the 2000s Queer as Folk series and the two 2022 <laughs> reboot on Peacock. True story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty proud of that one. <laughs> Across town in Beverly Hills and a million miles from Griffith Park, the Will Rogers Memorial Park is LA's most famous cruising spot, thanks to George Michael, who was arrested for committing a lewd act in the park's men's room. I can't say I blame him. The arresting officer was pretty hot, and according to George, he was playing with himself too. My friend Joe popped my cruising cherry in that same stall. A fitting tribute, I thought. We even smoked a post-coitus joint on the roof of the pink-dipped Beverly Hills Hotel. 
I don't remember how we got up there, but Joe was a magician when it came to getting into places you weren't allowed. Like most modern day pioneers arriving in LA, I spent my early years here in complete disbelief of everything that was happening before me. The news stories I saw on TV, those locations were now backdrops to my stories. Joe and I sat with our legs dangling over the rooftop of the Beverly Hills Hotel, looking out over the park's koi ponds, rose gardens, and the incredibly tall palm trees. Sharing one set of headphones, we listened to our favorite George Michael songs on my iPod. Mine was older, his was John and Elvis are dead. And if you haven't heard those songs, you should check them out. We imagined George walking past the fountain to the men's room. You couldn't pick a more perfect slice of Beverly Hills to cruise. The five acre triangular park was originally the front lawn of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Sunset Boulevard now separates the cowboy from the showgirl. Today, the Pink Palace is owned by the Sultan of Brunei, a country that stones and whips to death its gay citizens. In the United States, when the LGBTQ community isn't being used as a wedge issue for political gain, conservatives mock and humiliate us as punishment for being born. A different form of sticks and stones, but arguably just as destructive. It was especially true in 1998 when George was arrested, and it still holds true today. George refused to be shamed by the homophobic attitudes of the late 90s. His actions in the wake of the cruising controversy paved the way for loud and proud pop stars like Lil Nas X, Ricky Martin, Willa Young, Ollie Alexander of Years and Years, and countless of other talents have credited George with inspiring them to live their truth. At the time of his arrest, it was an eye open it was eye-opening to see that institutionally homophobic newspapers try their damnedest to humiliate the pop star and a public more than willing to laugh along. How was a 16-year-old boy in deep red Texas supposed to come out? George's defiance in the face of public shaming ultimately gave me the strength to go outside of my closet and step into the sunshine. My teenage years are divided into before George Michael came out. I thought I was doing a pretty good job of playing a straight, but a home movie from Christmas that same year contradicts this. In the video, I'm way too excited about getting a Marilyn Monroe calendar. And I'm wearing an I Love Lucy t-shirt with, you know, it's them crossing, I guess, the Golden Gate Bridge, all four of them in the car. And it's tucked into my purple jeans. Yeah, I did not bring the video with me. Six months after George's coming out party, and like George, I came out to my parents in a letter when I was away at college. My husband, Jason, came out the same way. George's mom was upset that she wasn't there to help him through the trauma of losing a partner. George, the love of his life, died of AIDS years earlier when he was still closeted. My mom was angry that I didn't trust her enough to tell her sooner. It had more to do with telling dad. Even she was worried about his reaction. Jason's mom was relieved that, his com that it was a coming out letter, not a list of her failures. In my letter, I jokingly blamed my sister for turning me gay for letting me play with her Barbies. I thought it was funny. I don't think she thought it was all that funny. And after our mom died, my sister gave me the letter back. And to this day, I can't bear to read it. And Jason can't read his either. We cringe at what we might have written. But returning to the dorms after class, my roommate Donovan informed me that my dad kept calling. They received the letter. I'd been waiting two weeks for this call. I, I thought they had disowned me. But if you can believe it, the stupid letter got lost in the mail. I was hyperventilating when I called dad back. He answered before the phone even rang on my end and I started crying right off the bat and I apologized. You listen to me. He sounded serious and very scary. Don't you ever apologize for who you are. You hear me? Now we want you home this weekend so we can take you out to dinner. By Friday night, dad was making bad jokes and asking inappropriate questions about gay sex at Outback Steakhouse. <laughs> we were relieved he handled it so well, well be, because before I came out, dad made AIDS jokes and called people fag in front of me. He would later say that he was trying to push me to say, fuck you, dad, I'm gay. <laughs> yeah. Jason experienced some of the same from his dad, but like mine, he's now Jason's biggest supporter. How many gay guys are afraid to come out because of their dad? Almost every single one of them, probably. When mom was on her deathbed, dying from cancer, dad took me down to the chapel and apologized for the way he treated me. I was wrong, he said. I had never heard this man apologize for anything, much less admit that he was wrong. Dad wasn't given the tools to deal with having a gay son. When it came crunch time, he stepped up and hit one out of the park. I might not have come out if it hadn't been for George Michael. But like the singer said, you gotta have faith and sex. Years later, 
<laughs> Years later, Jace and I were having this romantic Christmas getaway at the famous roadside attraction, the Wigwam Motel, off Route 66, when news broke that George Michael had died at the age of 53. We were staying at the motel to escape our meth-addicted upstairs neighbor who had crashed his black Mercedes into a telephone pole across the street days before. This reminded me of all the times George was discovered passed out in his car. After one such incident, George's partner, Kenny, told the son, he's fine, I got him a McDonald's. Our neighbor needed more than a Big Mac. He needed rehab and we needed a break from his weeknight orgies. Jason and I, that's what you get for living in West Hollywood. Jason and I decorated the teepee with red and green streamers, twinkling lights, and a miniature Christmas palm tree we bought at Ralph's, turning the soundproof wigwam into our very own Club Tropicana. I heated up tamales as Jason popped open a bottle of champagne. We exchanged presents under our flammable palm tree. And in a bizarre coincidence, the night before George's death hit the news on Christmas morning, Jason gifted me a copy of the George Michael Faith video collection on VHS, just like the one I had growing up. And of course, our TP had a VCR, so we drifted to sleep watching George shaking his butt, but that piece would be short-lived. We woke up hungover on Christmas morning to the news that George Michael had passed away at home in his bed. His partner, Fadi Fawaz, found him after Fadi had spent the night in the car outside the singer's home. The couple had argued, unfortunately, on Christmas Eve. Hard as it might be to believe, at such a young age, George died of natural causes. Jason and I cried before spending the day dancing around the TP, blasting his music. On our way home from the Wigwam Motel, we made a detour to the Will Rogers Memorial Park with a bouquet of red roses we picked up from a gas station. And in another eerie coincidence, the bouquet had a sticker on it with the word FREEDOM in all caps. <laughs> It was kind of nice. We weren't alone with our tribute. Fans had already left teddy bears, vinyl records, and printed song lyrics at the men's room entrance. <laughs> George Michael had been a lifesaver to me when he was famously outed. I may, have been a I may have been closeted at the time of his arrest in 1998, but when he died in 2016, I was an out and proud gay man dancing to his music with my husband in a teepee. I have George Michael to thank for giving me the faith to be myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, pull. Can you pull something out of my bag? I have something in here. One. I meant to pull, bring this up with me. But hold on. And this was it. The George Michael VHS tape. Awesome. Thank you, David. You're so awesome. That was good. How do y'all feel? I feel good. I've never been here. The crowds. Fantastic. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, like, I don't think, yeah, this is all out of your, like, your creative, like, so cool. stepping feet. I'm glad to see you in a bookstore. <laughs> I know. Please give me another home. Okay. I'm going to get one of you all. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Look at this one, guys. I got a bowl over here. Throw it over here. Okay, look at that. Steve and Lisa. What is it? Oh, this is a mail on the road. I like taking pictures. Whose is this from? Thank you. Oh. Huh? <laughs> I got this lovely calendar from 